Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our Insuring Community Association's PUD webinar. Um, I'm Michelle Baldwin, your underwriter here at CID Insurance. Um, I would like to introduce our two presenters today from USOI, Jenny and Christina. Uh, they are both product specialists in PUDs, so they were gracious enough to uh, offer their time to teach this webinar for us. Um, I do want to also introduce Jacob Cole. He is our marketing coordinator. He'll be here to make sure everything runs smoothly for us during this presentation. Um, before I turn it over to Christina and Jenny, I do want to remind everyone, um, and those who are new to our webinars, you will be in mute during the presentation. So if you have any questions, feel free to type them into the chat box, and we'll make sure we, we get them answered throughout the presentation. Or if you have questions afterwards, we'll make sure you get an answer one way or the other. Um, so if you have any questions, like I said, just type them in the chat box, and we'll make sure they're answered. Uh, Jenny and Christina, we'll let you guys take it from here. Awesome. Thank you so much, Michelle. And good morning or good afternoon, everyone, depending on which time zone you're in. Um, my name is Christina Marushak. I am the assistant product leader for com the Community Association Package. And today we are very fortunate to share with you about um, Insurance Community Association planned unit developments. So before we get started, just wanted to just sh share the agenda for you uh, or with you just regarding we're going to highlight what the opportunity is and how many community associations there really are. And um, there are quite often and there are a few, um, definitely a lot of, there isn't a lot, a lot of opportunity. And then we will share with you understanding the difference between condo associations and planned unit developments. Planned unit development product features and advantages, there are quite a few. And then we're going to wrap it up with a few easy ways of how to obtain a quote for these different types of associations. All right, so starting out with the opportunity, um, in 2019, there was a report that came out that says over 350,000 community associations are across the US. So more than 75 million Americans live in these association governed communities. So if you break that down, that's really about one in or one in every four people that you know, they most likely live in a one of these associations, whether it's a condo association or a planned unit development. Um, and then there's also, there are over 55,000 property managers in the US that handle homeowners associations or community associations. I also wanted to share that um, within these associations, there are these boards of directors and there are about 25 million of so, um, Americans that serve on the boards. And between all those Americans, there's about 90 million hours of um, service that they're providing to these associations. It's really just, a, it's really important that they are governing and implementing the bylaws and making sure that all the covenants are put into place and really understanding the concerns of these association members. So what types of community associations do we see? The most common types that we see are your homeowners associations or planned unit developments, your residential condo associations, um, your town home associations, again, uh, the planned unit developments, as I mentioned, property owners associations and mobile home owners associations. We can consider um, these associations, as long as there's really the government or the bylaws that are in place and making sure that the membership is mandatory in these types of associations. Just a picture of exactly what you're seeing for what you see for most of the homeowners or planned unit developments. They are your single family homes. Um, and the, you know, they commonly do have streets and roads that they are maintaining between the areas in, in the association. So just to share with you some challenges when placing homeowners associations, um, the first and foremost is that many carriers, they do require accord applications, different carrier apps, supplementals, pictures, loss runs for review. Um, when you're when you're sending these over to CID and um, USLI, that's not something that we require. We can provide coverage, you know, if you already have an Accord app or simply just we, Jenny will share with you at the end of the presentation, the very limited information that we would need in order to quote these types of associations for you. 
you also may deal with various underwriters and handling various lines of coverage. The great thing with working with us is that when we are the nonprofit package team, so we have the ability to package all lines onto one policy. And you're dealing with one underwriter, such as Jenny or myself, and we're really dedicated to you for the quote that we're working on. So again, on the nonprofit package team, we have the ability to provide coverage for the general liability, the property, the directors and officers coverage, and the hired and honor and auto, um, all packaged into one. Again, so there is an unstable marketplace with a lot of, with a lot of these carriers. We are seeing many changes that you know certain carriers are providing not in minute terms or they're also no longer writing these types of associations. So this is definitely an opportunity for you to think of us when we are able to write them. And then last but not least, it takes too long to get a quote or policy or simply even a response. Um, when you're working with us, we do pride ourselves on being a very competitive company and we used to have a standard, if you send us something by 2 p.m., we would have something to you no later by five but we understand that sometimes things are needed much faster. So you have the ability to, or we are now working on a rolling three hour turnaround that way that we can provide you with you know, quick quotes, quick answers. Um, we also at the end, Jenny will share with you a little bit about how you're able to web quote if you prefer that, or even give us a call and we're happy to discuss these associations with you to provide you with that quick turnaround. So just to highlight a few property components, um, for these planned unit developments or single family homes, the associations are not responsible for the residential structures. The individual, uh, the individual homeowners should have coverage for their single family homes. Um, but what types of property components would these associations have if it's not for their homes? So a lot of them may have clubhouses that they're having, cabanas, mail kiosks, walls, fences, security gates, guardhouses, um, irrigation systems, if they do have a pool, playgrounds, tree shrubs. You can see that there is a wide variety of different property components that we are, share, um, that we are able to cover. Um, so just let your application be your guide. On the application, we do list out many of these outdoor properties components so all you'd simply need to do is just provide us with a limit and we'll be able to to underwrite it for you we do have the ability to write up to 1.5 million dollars um, for these outdoor property coverages if they have that clubhouse or a playground or light poles and fences and then this is just to share with you exactly the, the types of property components that we see. As I mentioned, a lot of associations, they may have a welcome sign or you know, just um, a, a sign that simply says the name on their community. If there are fences, um, you know, any sort of outdoor street lights or lamps that they are able to provide, we can provide that property component for these planned unit developments. And then the general liability exposure. So in addition, to that, that is something that is really key for these associations. So as I mentioned, we can provide property for pools or a clubhouse. A lot of these associations, they have common amenities, which is something that we really pride ourselves on that we can provide coverage for. So if it is um, a coverage for a pool, if they have common walkways or streets, um, bodies of water, if there is a beach or a lake, a pond, um, security guards, trails, that's really, we do have the ability to provide a wide variety of different types of exposures and classes of business for the general liability. And again, here is just a picture of a few examples of, um, of the amenities that we commonly see in these types of associations. And the key underwriting information um, that we would need actually. Um, this is something that I'm going to pass off to Jenny. That way she can share with you a little bit about what we will need in order to provide you with a quote. Thank you, Christina. Um, welcome everyone. My name is Jenny Merson. I am the product leader for our community association package. Um, so jumping right back in on um, the key underwriting information that would impact the rate. So for the liability, um, we would primarily need the number of homes um, and whether or not there's any rental units, we can consider up to 50% of the units rented. 
Um, we will also need to know if that rental exposure is an annual term, if they're tenants, or if it's a short-term vacation rental. Um, we also uh, will look at the past loss history. We do require the past five years um, to look at. Again, we don't necessarily need that at quoting, but we will require it subject to binding. Um, and then we'll also need to know the amenities. So as Christina mentioned, if there's a pool, we'll just need to know the number of pools. Um, if and if there's any other things that need to be covered. Um, that could be a playground, um, a lake, boat slips, um, uh, open space, if there's designated, you know, open common areas that the residents can use for picnics or recreational activity, um, anything like that. Um, dog parks. Um, we really, as Christina mentioned, have a pretty broad perspective when it comes to the amenities so we can cover most of those exposures that we're going to see. Um, for the property coverage, uh, we would need to know the construction type if there is a common building that the association owns like a clubhouse or um, a, a gatehouse. Um, this could even be something as small as a shed if they have it on property to store, you know, maybe some landscaping tools. Um, and then the total insurable values we would need broken down by component. So if they have you know, a mail kiosk, an outdoor, you know, monument or sign, um, and let's say street or light poles, um, we would just need to know the limit they would, they would want for each um, property component listed. So for our broad appetite, we can consider up to a thousand units on the HOA um, book and then 500 units on the condo association. So I, I can say, um, from our perspective, that about 90% of the associations we see um, are, are less than 150. So this really is a pretty broad appetite, considering we can go up to 1,000 on the HOA um, and 500 on the condo. So pretty, pretty broad um, coverage appetite there. Um, and as mentioned, we can do pools, clubhouses, sports courts, fitness centers, um, any other amenities that they may have. Um, the rental units, we can do up to 50%, as mentioned, um, and we can consider now short-term rentals um, in some states. So that's going to be Texas, California, Georgia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Maryland, New Jersey, and Virginia. So this would be on non-emitted paper, um, but like I said, we are um, starting to consider them now. Um, so hopefully in the future, we will be able to open that up to more states. But for right now, we um, just have those eight states listed. Um, and again, that would be a non-emitted quote. And the 50% threshold would still um, come into play for the number of rentals. Um, and then also new news for us and everyone is um, that we can now consider um, up to 70% or more constructed. So in the past, we required that the association was 90% or almost, you know, pretty much completed, developed. Um, we did lower that, um, and primarily to match our story for the DNO, we require that 70% of the units are sold. So at that point, we want to make sure that control of the board has been turned over to the association and that they have enough people in the association to have um, a fair vote. So that 70% sold, we wanted to match it to 70% constructed. Um, to just have an easier storyline and the, so that you can think of us when you're when you need a quote um, and this will um, be for associations that are less than 150 units when um, completely developed again like I said most of most of the associations that are in the United States are, are at least um, at 150 or less is what we typically see um, so with that being said um, 70% constructed if less than 150 units when completely built out. Um, and we would also still require that control of the association has been turned over to the board. And this is available in most states at this time. So the coverage available, um, as Christina mentioned, for the property, we can do up to 1.5 million total insurable value. So this could be, um, we could also consider for condominium buildings. Um, typically, obviously, it's going to be a smaller association. We typically in the past have called them condo mini. Um, they're probably roughly, depending on where they are located in the country, going to be most likely 10 units or less. Um, but we can do up to you know 15 or 20 units um, if, the, if the total insurable value of the building is less than 1.5 million. Um, and then again, we could do the co coverage for the clubhouses and then the outdoor properties, signs, fences, lights, trees, shrubs, 
Um, key, mailbox kiosks are, are another popular one that we see and many more. Um, on the general liability, I um, can say it's a coverage feature that we offer no deductible. Um, we can also consider adding the hired and non-owned auto liability. So this would be for, you know, if a board member maybe needs to run to the bank or the post office, or maybe, um, you know, a board member needs to go to the local um, a hardware store and pick something up. So that, that coverage would be there for them. Um, so we can add hired and non-owned auto. Um, the home unit owners are automatically included as an additional insured and as well as the property manager is automatically included as an additional insured, both on the GL and the DNO. And then lastly on this slide, uh, we have recently, this past year, um, have been able to offer a blanket waiver for the um, unit owners when it's required by state statute. Um, and this is something we were seeing quite frequently in Colorado, um, where condominium associations um, have in their statutes that there's a blanket waiver. So we have been able to adapt um, and add that as well. We've also seen that in Texas. So coverage also includes, um, so these are some of our, our best features. So it's off-premise coverage. So this could be for board meetings. Um, if you have maybe a single family association or um, a planned unit development that maybe doesn't have a clubhouse, um, Maybe they had their, their board meetings off-site at the local law library or elementary school. Um, the coverage would extend off-site with them for, the, for those meetings. And then also their special events are, are included. So this could be a community party, maybe a community yard sale, a holiday event. Um, you know, those community-sized community, community -sized events are going to be automatically included. Um, and we do also provide host liquor liability as well. For the property coverage, um, we do offer special form of coverage, um, so the broadest coverage form on all the outdoor property, um, and it was, would also be at replacement cost valuation. And then uh, lastly, um, we can offer the blanket property coverage in California, Texas, South Carolina, and Nevada. Um, with that being said, we would just need the total um, limit that they are requesting for all of their outdoor property. This would not be for the building structures. So the building structures we would still schedule out separately, but all the remaining outdoor property we could list together. So community association professional key coverages. So this is going to come into play. Um, all, all homeowners associations, when they um, set up their um, legal entity, are going to be required to have a board of directors. Um, so with the board of directors comes the directors and officers coverage that we can also package. Um, and some of the features that we offer are unlimited defense outside the limit, so that's one of our best features. Um, it's going to provide coverage for non-monetary coverage, um, and then defense coverage for breach of contract claims, um, a lifetime occurrence reporting provision, uh, property management extension, like I said, the property manager um, will be included. Um, and then the third party discrimination and harassment coverage. So that's pretty much going to be like the EPL coverage. Um, it's automatically included with the DNO coverage um, as long as there's less than 10 employees. Um, and as for as long as I've been <laughs> underwriting this, I haven't seen um, too many associations that have more than 10 employees. So most likely it's going to be included for no additional charge. And then lastly, we also, also also include a data and security endorsement um, that provides, you know, um, a couple sublimits on um, if they maybe have a, um, a web page or have electronic data of information. And so community associations have very unique exposure, so we want to make sure that we have everything covered. So it's a really um, nice feature that we can add all of these um, coverages together on one package. All right, Jenny, one, we have a question. I just want to get that answered real quick before you continue. Um, so the question was, um, this agent has um, associations that where the developer is still on the board um, and they haven't turned it over to the resident. Um, so unfortunately, I, USLI, as they mentioned, they aren't in a market for that. And I myself don't have any other options at this time um, that will do it when the um, association hasn't been turned over to the board yet. So if the um, developer is still part of the board, I'm not going to be able to assist you guys with those ones at this time. Thanks, Michelle. Yeah, so we can, if the builder developer is still on the board, um, we can consider them, um, but we would still need control of the board turned over. 
Um, so there is on our application is a two part question. We do ask, has it been has it been turned over? Um, we want that to be yes, and then um, you know the builder developer could still be on the board, but that control aspect of it has to be turned over. And usually in most states, um, once it is um, once it, once the association gets to a certain threshold of being completed, the state typically requires the builder developer to to hand that control over to the board. All right, and we have one more question um, regarding special events. Um, so they're asking, do they require homeowners to have their own liability coverage, uh, say if they're hosting a party in the clubhouse? Uh, generally speaking, I would say that most, you know, associations, especially in their CCNRs, would state something along the lines that they would require uh, their unit owners, if they're going to host something in uh, the community clubhouse, that they should have some sort of special event policy in place. Uh, do you agree, Jenny? I do agree, and I was just going to say that's one of the, the um, I think you hit the nail on the head, is that each association is going to have their own CCNRs and bylaws, so their covenants, conditions, and restrictions, and that's really what you have to kind of read through and go through to see what the, the rules and regulations are for each association, but yes, typically um, what we would see is that the, um, that the association would want that unit owner to have their own coverage in place if they're going to especially have you know a significant size party okay so i think we'll keep going then um unless anybody has any other questions doesn't look like it yet so you can keep going okay so for up next um claims activity and causes for concern um 25% of the claims that we typically see are non-monetary claims. 35% um, could be breach of contract, and then 40% um, could be other claims. So claims activity and cause for concern. So one of the, so like like the previous slide said, 25% of the claims that we're going to see, see are going to be your non-monetary claims. Um, this could be challenging the board elections, um, or let's say an architectural review. Um, you know, sometimes, sometimes I think residents, when they're living in these community associations, forget that there's rules in place. Um, so sometimes, you know, it could be non-monetary, where somebody is not necessarily asking for a monetary reward, um, but it could be that, you know, maybe their neighbor put up a private, a private, a privacy fence that, you know, maybe it's 10 feet, and the the association's governing documents indicate that you can only put up a six-foot fence. Um, and maybe the neighbor's upset because they can't see now the lake because that fence is blocking their view. So um, it could be that, you know, that neighbor doesn't necessarily um, doesn't necessarily want a monetary reward. They just kind of want the fence removed, especially if it's against the rules. Um, so those are the types of claims that we can see um, for non-monetary. Um, breach of contract, um, typically these are going to be the ones that you see where the association has a contract with a vendor um, and you know for some reason that contract um, doesn't go through or somebody you know wants to drop out so we can typically see the countersuit um, we will provide the defense costs only um, and an example I can provide would be you know maybe the um, association hires a contractor to paint the exterior of a condo building um, the job's supposed to be done in three months. After three months, the job's still not done. They're having trouble communicating with the contractor, so um, they kind of uh, sever the sever the contract at that point. Um, and then the the contractor could then counter sue because he obviously wants his money um, to to complete the job. So that's typically what we'll see in that in that situation. Um, and then the breach of contract of the bylaws. So this is very common. Um, again, as each association has their own rules and um, covenants in place. Um, you know, if, if the bylaws are not followed, um, then that's where the lawsuit's going to come into play. Um, and then lastly, discrimination and harassment. Um, it's a coverage feature that we include the EP, the Employment Practices Liability Coverage in there. Um, and this could be for for third. It could be for third party um, third parties as well. So. With that, um, an example I read recently where um, the association had fined an individual because she had a dog that was over 35 pounds. And so they fined her and she sued because the dog was actually um, a prescribed support dog, an animal support dog. 
Um, so they did not realize that um, instead of somebody probably going and asking on the board before sending the fine, they had just sent her the fine. So, so she sued um, for discrimination. Um, and it, it, it happens. I, I read one a couple weeks ago where um, we had a unit owner and a, a and their neighbor who happened to be a board member uh, were arguing over a parking spot. Um, so I've, I always say, you know, this is a very um, personal product um, because, you know, as, as homeowners, um, your home is your biggest investment. So you're obviously are going to want to protect it um, and live your lifestyle. So, and of course, you know, the more shared walls you have, um, the more the more issues are going to arise when you're sharing um, your community or your building with other people. So the lifetime occurrence reporting provision, um, we call it the LORP, um, and it pretty much will provide coverage. Um, I think the best way for me to always explain this is to provide an example. Um, so if Christina and I are on the board of the association that we live in, um, and we've had coverage in place, we've had the DNO and GL coverage in place for years. Let's say Christina and I are gonna step down so that somebody else can come on and take on the duties. Um, that new board is voted in, um, and that new board decides that they're not going to um, renew their GL and DNO coverage. So primarily the DNO coverage is what we're focusing on here. So let's say they do not renew that DNO coverage. So they decide not to renew, they have no coverage in place, and then a claim comes in. So the LORP is going to provide coverage for Christina and I that for, for the claim that happened while we were on the board. Um, so that's what the coverage um, is intended to provide. Um, it's very difficult to, to find this coverage in the marketplace, so it is a coverage feature for us. Um, it's granted for no additional premium. Um, we can offer the tail coverage and then also you're purchasing peace of mind, um, you know, especially if you're going to step down and have somebody else take over the control. So we make it very quick and easy. Um, we do provide this product on our instant quote uh, over the phone. Um, and the number is there, if you guys would like to write that down, it's 877-969-7539. Um, it's one of our most popular products on our team to get a quick and easy quote over the phone. I can say in less than five minutes, if you have the eligibility requirement, you'll get a quote. Um, and you can also quote this product online. Um, and it does have a web chat feature to instant message underwriters if you have questions. Um, and also, if it goes into a submit status online, an underwriter will get back to you most likely within that three-hour turnaround. So some of the benefits, um, we can, you know, consider, we can offer the pre-filled application on, on most circumstances. Um, you can speak to an underwriter at any time, um, and then a no, no accord form is needed. So what you need to quote, um, just as a refresher for the general liability, we would need the number of homes. Um, that are going to be in the association when it's developed or completed. Um, and then the amenities, as we've discussed. For the property, we need the values and then the brief description of the property to be covered. And then DNO is very easy for us to quote because we also just need the number of units. So we can easily add on the DNO if we are already quoting the GL. Um, we'll just you know, carry that, that number of units over and we can provide both coverage lines. And then the number of employees, like I said, if it's more than 10, then we would need to know. So how to get a quote online. Um, so quickly, the most important question that you're going to come across is in the beginning, it's going to say who's responsible for the insurance and maintenance of the residential property. Um, again, going back, this can be found in the association's bylaws, um, covenants and restrictions, their CCNRs. Um, and we would um, rate it for a condo association if the association is responsible for the insurance and maintenance on the residential buildings. Um, and then if it's um, if the individual unit owners are responsible for the insurance and maintenance of the residential building, we rate for it as a homeowners association. So this will determine the class and pricing um, for your quote. So what do you need to do to bind? Um, so once you have the quote, um, we have a pretty seamless process that the subjectivity items on the quote will, will let you know exactly what we need to go into binding. Um, and then um, 
I will say that some of the questions will impact eligibility and they will also impact the rate. Um, so if you really want to um, firm up your quote, you know, I would suggest getting that information over to us um, quickly. Or if you want to, um, when you're on the phone, you can also ask to have a full quote um, feature and they'll go through all the eligibility questions with you. But other than that, um, at this time, if there's no DNO, uh, we can um, do a 21 day subjectivity item for to get the completed application. If we are quoting the DNO, we would need a full completed application at binding. All right, thank you, Jenny and Christina. I really appreciate you guys' time today and presenting for us. Um, before I close up, I do see we have a question. Um, so they're asking, do you have resources to help determine values for common area items? Um, if the association, most associations do um, have some sort of reserve study. It's not necessarily something that's done every year, um, something maybe every other year or every few years. Um, that's definitely a good tool to use in order to determine the item or if they currently have coverage in place. Um, you know, going off of their current policy to figure out what limits they have and then, you know, comparing them to the reserve study to see if it's something that they, you know, maybe should they should they increase the limit or maybe they need to decrease the limit because they're over-insuring certain items, things like that. Um, so that's definitely uh, one avenue in determining um, how much to put for those common area components. Um, so if anybody else has any other questions, feel free to type them in. Um, if we don't answer them right now over there, I'll make sure to send you guys an email and get your questions answered. Um, and then again, thank you again, Jenny and Christina. Um, if you guys, please feel free to check out our website at CIDinsurance.com. You can find our applications, um, upcoming webinars. Um, our, this uh, webinar will be posted on there as well as past webinars that we have taught. Um, so if you need to contact me, my information is there on the screen. Um, and you're, feel free to submit your um, submissions over to us as soon as you, as you can. And we look forward to doing business with you. So thank you again for all attending. And have a great day.